Let me add my words of let me add my words of welcome this morning. Are we up there? Is that all good? Good to see you here on this holiday weekend. And uh, okay, here's a random, random, random question for everybody because some of us really get into this. How many of you listen to the classic 100 countdown over the the weekend. Yeah, I see a few hands out there. So, Heather Wickstead, what was your favorite instrument? The gum leaf. What the heck is that? I have no idea. Steve, what's your fa- what was your favorite instrument? Um, I had voice was instrument. The voice was number one. Cello was was, and of course, Elwin is oboe. I mean, yeah. So the the countdown, the 100 countdown this weekend on the classic 100 is what's your favorite instrument? So they're. Hurdy gurdy. That was yesterday. Yes, indeed. We get so into this thing, you know. We are glued to that for the whole weekend. It's like, okay, we're at like number forty right now. So, anyway, you know what I'll be doing this afternoon? Yes, is listening to that to find out what is my number one instrument going to be on the list. So, um, just a, a word of family news as well. As we are together uh, as family, um, I received word just this past week that Heather Henson's father has passed away. Not completely unexpected, but uh, be, be in prayer for Heather and, um, and for Ross as they are grieving the loss of her father. And uh, got a nice long email from Heather as well, just about ministry in Greece and how things are going with them. And it sounds like they are having a fantastic time and some wonderful ministry opportunities. And uh, so it's, they are, they're just having a terrific time. She said they were taking a week break um, just to, just to catch their breath on everything that was happening. But they've had some great opportunities to pray with people for healing and to see Uh, people's lives being touched in some really wonderful ways. So continue to pray for Heather and Ross. Does anybody remember when they actually, Kathy, do you know when they get back? I can't remember the actual date. It's like end of July maybe or something? 10th of July. I was thinking it was in July somewhere. So another month or so, they'll still be gone. So we look forward to... um, I miss looking down and seeing them sitting right there. I... I, I, (laughs) Somebody just sit right there and act like they're Heather and Ross, you know. (laughs) Thank you, Joe. (laughs) But uh, anyway, but let's continue to pray for them and uh, for the ministry that they are having uh, in Greece. And uh, it sounds like it's it's been a great time for them, and uh, so we continue to pray for them. Um, In fact, honey, would you just pray for Heather and Ross right now and and for um, the ministry of grace, especially to Heather as she is... Um, grieving the loss of her her father and um, for their continued ministry. Father, we're so grateful that by prayer we can reach out and be linked with our brother and sister Ross and Heather. And so we do pray in this moment for them, asking for the peace and the comfort to abound through them through the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the wonderful opportunities for ministry that they have had so far. We trust you for more. And bring them safely home to us. We look forward to that day. But for this day, we pray that you will be close to them in a special way as they as they grieve the significant loss. So we pray for them with gratitude and joy in Jesus' name. Well, we are continuing our study in the book of Nehemiah, and we are in the last part of chapter 4 today, and you can see that our wall is coming along, so i um, excited to see the, the tools and the things that are here, but as we are going through the book, and as Nehemiah and his people are rebuilding their wall, we are rebuilding our wall up here to see this work that God is doing in in us and hopefully through us. So exciting to see that happening. In 1927, the editors of Time magazine began a tradition that continues to this day. It is the annual selection of Time's 
person of the year. Oddly enough, the tradition was born out of an attempt to remedy an editorial embarrassment, which happened earlier that year. They did not have aviator Charles Lindbergh on the cover of the magazine following his historic transatlantic flight. And so by the end of the year, it was decided that a cover story featuring Lindbergh as the man of the year would serve both purposes. Over the years, the magazine editors have selected one or a group of people who stand out as newsmakers or influential people from the events of that previous year. In 2006, rather than featuring a photograph of a famous person, the cover of Time had a glossy silver panel. Does anybody remember that particular issue of Time magazine? Yeah, Ross does. It served as a mirror. Who was Time's person of the year? You. Me, with the caption on the front cover, yes, you. You control the information age. Welcome to your world. From that time, we have seen the escalation of an individual-centered world. It has taken the, the tendencies of an individualized culture to a whole new level. YouTube, because remember it's all about you, to iPhones and iPads because it's all about me. And we have coined new words for ourselves that feature ourselves like selfies in which I am the subject of my own photos. Sadly, our self-centered world has infiltrated our understanding of our own spirituality and our life of faith. Too many of us have bought into the lie, and I want to call it out as a lie, that my own faith and my own spirituality is an individual and private practice. It is something for me and me alone. I'm often reminded in Genesis chapter 3 that the first effects of sin were the breakdown of every relationship that we understand and that we know and that we experience. Before we look at Nehemiah chapter 4, turn with me for a few moments to Genesis chapter 3. How did we get where we are? Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man said to his wife, and his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. We see in this passage that the man and the woman eat of the forbidden tree, the one tree that God said, you, you are not to eat of this fruit, because in the day you eat of it, there will be severe consequences. 
They eat of the tree, and what happens? They, they cover themselves. They hide from God, and I would suggest that they hide even from themselves. And it reminds me that the very essence of our fallen condition is to pull away from each other, to isolate ourselves and to cover over our sin, to cover over our guilt, to, to cover over our shame. That is the condition that we, we so often find ourselves and that we live in. The, the tendency of every one of us is to pull away from others. You see, Adam and Eve didn't only hide from God. They hid from each other. They even hid from themselves in pointing the finger at others and saying, it's her fault. No, it's his fault. No, it's somebody else's. I am not to blame for my condition. And God's process of bringing us back into spiritual wholeness is to restore the relationships that have been broken by the fall, to restore us into community, to rebuild us as a people. We are not simply working on my personal spiritual growth and my personal spiritual life. We are rebuilding relationships because that's where our spirituality is lived out. I was reminded of this beautiful prayer by Robert Mulholland. Let's let this be our prayer as we look into this passage today. Gracious God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, deliver me, I pray, from the easy habit of thinking that my spirituality is something between you and me alone. It is so difficult to accept the idea that my spiritual wholeness cannot be attained outside of my life with others. Help me to open my heart and spirit to what you have to say to me and help me to commit my relationships to you that they may become channels of your grace in my life and that I may become a channel of your grace for others. Every one of us is a channel of grace to others. And every other person in this room is a channel of grace to me. And that's how God works and builds us up. What a beautiful reminder. Do not buy into the lie that your faith, your spirituality is all about you. We are formed in, in community and in relationship with one another. I think one of the most important realizations we have to come to in our own spiritual growth is fighting against this idea that it's all about me, my passions, my fulfillment. God's work of rebuilding and restoring his people is always to restore the broken relationships and draw us back into a community that reflects the image of Jesus. The one who, who gave himself completely and unconditionally to other people and for others. As I have said before, if you want a good litmus test of your own spiritual growth, take a look at the nature of your relationships with other people. But not only is that a good test of our spiritual growth, but relationships are the place where that spiritual growth happens. Every relationship is an opportunity for an, a, a, a transforming encounter with God. And every relationship is also an opportunity for a transforming ministry to other people. And this brings us to Nehemiah chapter 4. Where we find the Jews who are continuing their work on, on rebuilding the wall and 
And, and as we read from verse 15, we, we discover the emphasis of the passage isn't so much on, on the project before them, but the emphasis is on the people themselves. As we discover the ways that God is, is not only rebuilding the, the physical walls of Jerusalem, but the ways that God is rebuilding his people restoring this, this community that has, been, that has been destroyed through the exile. Let's see how he does that. Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning at verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. And from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, and our God will fight for us. And so we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes, each kept his weapon at his right hand. An interesting passage, obviously, that flows out of the situation in the previous part of the chapter where they are threatened, not only with words, but they are threatened with physical violence, these people who oppose the work that they are doing. And so Nehemiah has this plan, how do I draw the people together? to support one another, to encourage, to build up one another, to protect one another as we continue in this project. We notice, first of all, that there is a renewed focus on what they are here to do. We see in verse 15, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Yes, they have experienced this threat from the enemy, not just verbal insults, but, but even threats of physical harm. And there is this very real uh, experience. There is the possibility of an attack here. And so at, at such a time, it is easy to become distracted by, by these, these, these threats from the enemy to pay more attention to, to the, the enemy, to retreat, to pull away, to isolate themselves. But, but after Nehemiah has encouraged the people in verses 13 and 14, which we looked at last week, he, he develops a plan of support, a, a plan where they, where they can encourage, where they can, they can protect one another. And then the people get back to work. There is a, a renewed focus on the work that needs to be done, which brings a sense of unity. It brings a sense of common purpose. This is what we are all about. Let's stay focused on the task here, people. We can be distracted by so many other things around us, but let's stay focused on the task at hand. It is so easy at times to become distracted by other influences and we forget why we have come together. And so there's this renewed focus, but we notice both the collective, we all returned to the wall, and the individual, 
each one to his, his personal work. Which reminds me that my personal work, whatever that is, is, is contributing to the whole. It's contributing to us as a community. Your work is contributing to us. And so there's this both this, this collective as well as the individual here. And while the enemy hasn't necessarily gone away, their focus is back on the task at hand. So they, they demonstrate a measure of discernment, a measure of awareness, and yet a common purpose. This is why we have come together. Let's stay focused on what we're here to do. But notice that while they go back to work, there is an ongoing awareness of a threat. And so verse 16, half of the people continue to work and half of the people stand by and protect them. And the leaders stand by to keep watch, to look out, to make sure everything is safe. And what we have here is a community that lives in readiness for anything that could happen. There, there is a watchful vigilance that is going on here, not only for their personal safety and concern, but, but their vigilance for one another. They are looking out to protect each other. So what Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, don't just look out for your own interests, but look to the interests of others. Take care of one another. And that's exactly what Nehemiah is doing here. How do we organize our community so that the work is getting done, but we're, we're protecting one another, we're caring for one another, we're looking out for one another. And that's exactly what he's describing here. When we lived in China, I met for a few years with a man who was a psychiatrist in a large hospital near our home. He was also the head of a network of house churches. Before we began to meet weekly in a mentoring relationship, he explained to me that there needed to be a few important rules that we would need to, to be aware of, that I would need to follow in, in, my, in my meeting with him. First, he said, I was never to come to his home. In fact, I wasn't even to know where he lived. I didn't even know where his house was. In fact, I don't even think I knew the neighborhood he lived in. That was necessary. That was important. Secondly, we would meet each week at the same location in a, des in a designated place that would be safe. And third, if he didn't ever come to our meeting, I was never to try and look for him or contact him. Those were the rules. And after he gave me these rules, he explained to me, you do not know the danger signs to look for. You don't know this culture well enough. You do not know when it is safe or when it is unsafe. He said, you need to trust me to look out for you. It was a sobering lesson to learn, but one that I discovered was absolutely necessary in my relationship with him and in my work in China. I needed someone else to be concerned for my safety and my welfare in a very unfamiliar place. So we met week by week for a few years. One evening, I went to our designated place, and he didn't show up. The next week, I went to our place, and he didn't show up. 
and the next, and the next. Three months. Every Thursday night, I went to the designated place, and he never showed up. But I never heard from him, so I just kept going back. Finally, one evening, there was a knock at our door. And I answered the door, and there he was. And he greeted me with these words, the danger is past. I will see you this week in our designated place. And then he just turned and walked away. You know, that may seem like a dramatic and unusual story. It was the story of my life for nine years, though. But it reminds me just how much we need to look out for one another. I have blind spots in my spiritual walk, and so do you. I could just as easily go off track without a loving and observant friend telling me what to watch out for. Sometimes my wife will point out a danger sign that she sees that I might ignore or just, just be looking the other way. We need to be vigilant for one another. We need to look out for one another. We need to pay attention to the danger signs where the enemy can gain a foothold in our community. That is exactly what these people do. They watch, they look, they protect, they are vigilant for one another against the attack of the enemy. But we also see that they pulled together and not apart. We, we notice that there are times when the community, community needed to be called together, to, to meet together for encouragement and strength. Look at verse 20. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Come together as a, as a group. There were times when the, when the people needed to be aware of, a, of a, an approaching danger. And so Nehemiah devised a warning system. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, come to that place. That, that will be the place of urgent need. That will the, be the place where we can come together as a community and, and support one another and build up one another and encourage one another draw strength from, from each other. I am sometimes concerned when, when someone asks me the question, and I've been asked this question many times over the years, why do I need to join a church? Why do I need to? What's, what's the point of coming every Sunday when I can just listen to a message online? I can just read a book. I could just stay home and, and, and nurture my own faith in my own way. During COVID, when we were all confined to our homes, I was, I was having to teach all of my classes online. And one evening as I was beginning a class on Zoom and the screen was filling up with the faces of all of my students joining from their own homes, you all remember what that's like hated that season of life. I'm just going to put it out there. I just hated it. I asked my students a question that night. How are you doing? I'll never forget the response of one of my students who says, we are losing our sense of belonging. We feel isolated and disconnected. I asked the rest of the students if they felt the same, and I could just see nods all across my computer screen. Yes, that's how we all feel. Isolated, disconnected, a, a loss of belonging, a loss of connection, a loss of relationships. And Nehemiah saw the danger in that, and he knew that there were times when the community needed to pull together for encouragement, support, protection. When we disconnect from God's people, there is more than just the loss of community. There is the loss of identity. 
we forget who we are. When we disconnect from God's people, we disconnect from our understanding of our true identity. The writer of Hebrews states the same concern. He says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, fellowship together is vital for our spiritual growth, both individually and as a community And of course, being in each other's lives is messy, messy work. I get that. Bearing one another's burdens sometimes means that we get dirty ourselves. We run the risk of offense, the risk of feeling used, the risk of being misunderstood, the risk of rejection... And I am reminded that Jesus himself experienced all of that and he thought the risk was worth it for you and for me. But there is a constant reminder that runs through all of this that Nehemiah says, never forget, God is fighting for us. All through this this passage is this reminder that ultimately the battle is the Lord's. It's not yours. It's not mine. Look at verse 15. God had frustrated their plan. And then verse 20, our God will fight for us. And I love that, that personal pronoun, that personal expression of this, our God, my God. God, your God, our God will fight for us. You see, I wonder how many of us labor under the delusion that our spiritual life is simply something that we must figure out, that we must do on our own, that we must somehow make it happen in our own strength, striving. It is a life-changing discovery when we learn to rest in God's strength, when we cease striving and we know that he is God. I love these words of Isaiah. He reminds us that in returning and rest you shall be saved in quietness and in trust. Your strength lies. I think the deeper work that God is doing is not the completion of a building project. The rebuilding of a wall as important as that is. But through this, God is rebuilding his people. There is this sense of connection and concern for one another. Their rediscovery of their true identity. It was the loss of that that sent them into exile. And so the returning from exile, God is rebuilding them as a people. This is the work that God wants to do in us. Some years ago, when I was serving as an elder in a large church in the States, we found ourselves in one of those challenging situations in which opinions were strong, perspectives were enormously divergent on this one, this one issue, and in our meetings, conversations sometimes turned tense. And there appeared to be divisions forming in this group of leaders who had worked together so well over the years. And in the midst of one heated discussion, one wise older pastor stopped the conversation. And he looked at us and he said, Save the relationships. If we lose that, we lose everything. It's interesting. I was saying to Sue this morning as we were driving here, one of the things that concerns me about an individualized spirituality 
it is often more important to be right than it is to be in relationship. Save the relationships. If we lose that, we lose everything. It was a moment when we all realized what was at stake. And we began to see people fighting for one another and not with one another. That is a vigilant faith where we seek the deeper work that God is doing. When when we realize how much we need one another, when we save the relationships, because if we lose that, we lose everything. Nehemiah teaches us this lesson of what a vigilant faith looks like. Working side by side, protecting one another, guarding one another, fighting for one another's holiness is something that we must never lose sight of. Let's pray. I don't know where all of this hits you. I know exactly where it hits me, though. I am keenly aware of this. Maybe you're one of those who needs someone else to come alongside and say, let me fight for you. I want to be the kind of church that comes alongside people in tough times and says, we are going to fight with you. Maybe you're in one of those seasons where you can look out for others. Be vigilant. Come alongside. Strengthen, build up, encourage one another. For all of us, it's time to pull closer together than we've ever been before. To seek God together. To look out for one another. To strengthen those relationships that form us in our identity and form our community. As a place where Jesus is seen and felt and heard. Help us, our Father, to be attentive to this work of rebuilding that you are doing in us. Help us not only to pay attention to you and your spirit, but to pay attention to one another. Not to fight against each other, but with and for each other. Help us, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen.